Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided. This threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Welcome. We're back with Access to Democracy. We're back with a return guest, and I'm really, really pleased to have Associate Justice David Strauss from the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, he's been here once before. Last time you were here, you were the junior justice, but you're not quite the junior justice anymore because there's been a new appointment to the court. That's right, Alan. Uh, recently, uh, the citizens may know that uh, Governor Dayton appointed uh, Judge Wilhelmina Wright uh, to the Minnesota Supreme Court. She was previously a Court of Appeals judge. Um, I'm looking forward to her starting. We're hoping that she gets started here in the next month or so. And, uh, you know, it'll be a new court, a new experience uh, with a new member of the court on, uh, on the court. And you won't have to serve the coffee anymore. I won't have to serve the coffee, <laughs> open the doors, or, or do any of the junior justice duties. Now, uh, your background is really interesting because you did all your undergraduate and law work in Kansas. And uh, following that, you actually clerked for three federal judges, and the last of which was Justice Clarence Thomas of the U.S. Supreme Court, who has certainly been one of the most noteworthy, worthy, if not the controversial judges on the court, even though he doesn't ask questions. But, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You also went on to teach at two law schools, and you taught for six or so years at the University of Minnesota Law School and were picked as the professor of the year at the uh, university. So that was quite a feather in your cap. And then along came Governor Pawlenty, who's now out of politics as of yesterday, right. and uh, appointed you to the Supreme Court. Uh, a well-deserved appointment notwithstanding the fact that uh, I've agonized over some of the decisions you participated in, but uh, some, and we talked about some of them last time, but really, really well thought out, well written, uh, really erudite decisions that you have participated in and or authored, and uh, it, it's really interesting. But Thanks. what brought you to Minnesota from Kansas? Well, you know, um, of course, I went to law school, as you mentioned, and, and undergrad at Kansas, and then we decided, you know, it's time to, to get out of Kansas. I grew up in Kansas, so we decided I'm going to take a clerkship anywhere anywhere in the country. And so we did this whirlwind tour. We did the West. I clerked out in the Ninth Circuit. We did the East. I clerked out in the Fourth Circuit. And one of the teaching jobs you mentioned was down in Alabama. Uh, so we, we spent some time in the South. And then we finally decided, my wife and I said, it's time to settle down. We've had our whirlwind tour of the United States. It's time to pick a place, settle down, and, and, and get the family going. Um, and so I went on the teaching market, and I sent my resume out to a number of schools. Um, I had a particular focus on the Midwest, because my wife and I, both growing up in Kansas, decided that the Midwest was where we wanted to settle down. And the school that attracted my interest, and thankfully I attracted their interest, uh, was the University of Minnesota. And they gave me an offer and they gave me a teaching package. They let me teach the classes that I wanted to teach and uh, I accepted the offer. And the rest, as they say, is history. That's right. Uh, <coughs> and you're, you're certainly in one of what, what I say as a 15-year Minnesotan, one of the great spots in the country to live. Yes, we have a little trouble with weather once in a while, but uh, I think you can't, the quality of life here can't be equaled uh, any place. Uh, 
what's available to us in the Twin Cities, whether it's sports or the arts or theater or anything else, uh, is, is really uh, what makes this place very unique. I think that's right, and one of the things that we noted <coughs> from the very beginning when we, when we came here was the, the family-friendly nature of the, of the place. There's plenty to do with your kids, and in fact, my youngest child, Ben, wa was born here, and so he's not known any, anything different, even though we spent so, many t so much time in different parts of the country, and, um, and both the kids have really enjoyed growing up and, uh, and, and participating in, in Minnesota life. And so I guess you can say uh, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Justice Thomas, um, because he hasn't asked a question in six years on the bench, and yet I understand, and I understand from you as well, that he's one of the most well-prepared justices, and it's interesting the dichotomy between his behavior on the bench and off the bench. Yeah, so one of the things that I think is, is interesting is the difference between the public and sort of private persona of Justice Thomas. Justice Thomas is viewed as is very conservative and, I, conservative, and I think that's fair, although it probably depends upon your definition of conservative. Um, but he's also viewed as very quiet on the bench as because of what you mentioned, which was six years without asking a question. Um, but, but, but the funny part is meeting him privately or, or even with a group of friends all the law clerks end up really falling in love with Justice Thomas in terms of his persona. He has a big booming laugh. Um, he has a great sense of humor. He's kind. Um, he's generous with his time. He probably spends as much time, if not more time, with law students and law schools around the country. Um, I had the great opportunity a couple of years ago to teach a class with Justice Thomas at the University of Minnesota Law School, and um, he could not spend enough time with the students. I mean, he, he set up additional programs and additional lunches and dinners just so he could spend more time talking to the students and getting to know them. And so um, he's, a, he's a terrific guy. He's very well prepared. The other justices often rely upon him on the bench uh, for, for, st for things that are in the record. You know, Justice Thomas, where is that in the record? So when you see Justice Breyer or some of the other justices talking to Justice Thomas, uh, it's often about the merits of the case, even though he doesn't ask a question. Interesting, interesting Di dichotomy of the person. Now, you were appointed July 1, 2010. That's correct. Now, for the first time in your life, you're running for election. You are on the ballot this fall uh, as, a, what is it, the fourth associate justice or the fourth district, whatever? Uh, associate justice seat four. Seat four. Okay, as we do it here in Minnesota. <coughs> and you actually have an opponent. So in addition to the court, in addition to the pressures, in addition to family, in addition to lecturing, as I know you do a lot of, you have to run for election. Uh, one of the things I don't like about the system. I don't think the judges should have to run for election. I don't think the judges should have to raise money. Uh, it was disastrous in West Virginia mm -hmm. where it really turned the court around. I would like to see justices appointed based on nonpartisan commission recommendations. But it is what it is. And so tell us about the election coming up. Well, it's interesting. Um, one of the things, you know, to address the, the election issue first is uh, my viewpoint is a little different than some of my colleagues. Uh, my viewpoint of judicial elections is it's not my call. I'm a judge, and I don't think the judges should be telling people how to select judges. And so I think it's, it's a matter for the legislature and the people. Um, and I think it's a very difficult question as well. Um, but in terms of being up for election this year, um, it's been a new experience for, for someone who was at the University of Minnesota uh, Law School and attained tenure and had job security, uh, even if I said or wrote things uh, that were controversial, to go from that to having, being up for election and having the citizenry uh, decide whether or not you have job security is a very different thing. With all of that said, one of the great things that's happened as a result of this election is I've met so many lawyers and citizens around the state that I didn't know uh, that have good ideas about what they want uh, the court system to offer and what they want the court system to do uh, that I've actually learned quite a bit um, throughout this process. Um, and I really appreciated that part of, part of the election. I know that uh, you are a person who never speaks ill of anyone. Uh, and I guess we would say that you are on the conservative wing of the court, and we'll talk about a couple of cases mm -hmm. coming up. But uh, the person who's running against you, 
as my research indicates, is really a right-wing radical uh, who can't separate theism from the judicial. And uh, so in that regard, uh, to me, it's no contest, but I know you still have to go around. And, and I tell our viewers, if you come out in the middle of the night and you see this man nailing a, a lawn sign in your lawn, uh, don't call the police. It's just just a stress. Yeah. It's an interesting process. I've never thought of myself as a politician. Um, I've always been interested in politics, but I've never thought of myself as a politician. And I don't think judges really are politicians, but I running for election makes you be, into yes, a politician. But you become one, right? Yeah. And every six years in Minnesota, until the system changes, judges have to run for election or re-election. So right. So you're there. It's the experience. I have no doubt that you're going to get the endorsement of all the major really media outlets and papers, but uh, notwithstanding, you still have to treat this election like any other election and work to win it. That's absolutely right. And, and connecting mm -hmm. with the voters, um, one of the things I'm proud of that we did was um, I set up a bipartisan committee uh, for election. We've, I've got two Democrats and two Republicans as the chair of my committee. Um, the lead chair, the person who does a lot of the work, uh, was actually an attorney for Governor Dayton and is a lifelong Democrat. I felt it was very important to have an ideological balance on my committee, and we are almost of the 30 or so people on the uh, committee. wouldn't be David Lillehog, would it? Well, David Lillehog is one of our supporters. It's Charlie Nowen. David, um, David has been here several times and uh, really one of the great lawyers in the Twin Cities. Yeah, he does a nice job. Uh, and uh, we've had so many lawyers on. and Actually, we've had five of the Supreme Court justices over the years on, and Paul Anderson, who I know is a favorite of yours, has been here about 30 times over 13 years. So always an education to have him here. Well, and he enjoys it. He uh, really likes to talk, talk to you and talk to the, talk to the people. And uh, what's the toughest decision you've had since you're on the court? You know, frankly, a lot of them are very, very <coughs> difficult. Um, you know, there's there, a lot of the cases, you know, and I can't think of one in particular off the top of my, my, off the top of my head, but a lot of the cases are really um, fairly clear cut. When you apply the law, even though there might be some ambiguity in it, you feel like it's more of a 70-30 or 75-25 type deal. But there's been maybe three or four cases um, that I've decided, um, w particularly first-degree murder cases, where there's been some really close calls, where I feel at the end of the day it's 52-48 or 51-49. And those are the ones that make it hard to sleep at night. I mean, you, the, the main thing I try to get out of it is I say, look, I may make a mistake. Everybody's human. I hope that I don't make any mistakes. But as long as I decide the case for the right reasons at the time I'm making the decision, in other words, I don't think about what the political parties might want. I don't think about what special interest groups might want. I don't even think about what my colleagues necessarily want me to do. It's all about calling them like I see them. As long as I make a decision for the right reasons, um, you know, you got, you got to move on and get to the next decision. And that's, that's sort of the way I view the job, because we make an awfully lot of tough decisions. And when we speak about your colleagues now, there have been some really bitter, bitter uh, disputes in the court in terms of the decisions that have come down. And we'll talk about uh, the two election cases uh, that the court just decided. What is the relationship of the judges once those cases are decided? Is there rancor? Is there bitterness? How do they react? You know, if you're on the if you're on the, the the minority side of a case that you feel strongly about, and, and I've certainly had some of those. There's a First Amendment case uh, that the court released about a month or a month and a half ago called State versus Crowley that I felt very very strongly about. Um, you're disappointed. You're you're di disappointing your colleagues, and you're disappointed um, in the way the case came out. That was but a four three decision, that wasn't was, it? It was yeah. a four three decision. But you know. At the end of the day, even though you're disappointed, um, you're going to be on the other side of one or more of your colleagues at any point in time. And it's a sort of a constant thing that's in flux. And so one of the things we try to do is maintain collegiality. Um, I think that this court, our Minnesota Supreme Court, is probably one of the most collegial Supreme Courts in the country. We get along. We, we're honest with each other. We have some very vigorous disputes and very vigorous conversations during um, conference and during oral argument. But at the end of the day, I think we all get along and we all respect each other's opinions because we know, and I think Justice Page has said this several times, that everybody he's ever served with is trying to call him like they see him, get to the correct result. And sometimes you just disagree, 
about what the correct result or the correct application of the law really is in a particular case. Now, I think the people, uh, our viewers, uh, would find it very interesting to follow the process. An appeal reaches the Minnesota Supreme Court. The papers are there. Lead us through what happens from that point until finally a decision is written. So once we've granted a case or taken a case through our mandatory jurisdiction, and we have mandatory jurisdiction over first-degree murder cases, workers' compensation cases, and tax court cases, once that case reaches us, um, we have a staff attorney's office, and the staff attorney's office randomly assigns the cases to each of the seven justices. And so you'll get uh, one-seventh of the number of cases that the court hears in a particular year. Um, it's your responsibility or your chamber's responsibility, and in the case of of all of us. Our law clerks have primary drafting responsibility for coming up with a bench memo uh, that's circulated to the entire court, which is a, a discussion of all the legal issues that have been advanced by the parties. Um, we then have oral argument. Every, you know, everybody on the court Before reads the bench. Before the bench memo, are there meetings and discussions among the judges? No, we don't discuss anything until after the oral argument of the case. Um, it is true that some of the other justices, if I'm assigned a a case, primary responsibility for a case, one of my colleagues may come in and talk to my law clerk about his or her bench memo, um, but there's no discussions about the merits of the case among the justices. So how do the law clerks arrive at the bench memo? Do they follow the justices' thinking, or do they just draft it based on what they see in the law? There's differing uh, uh, views on the court on what the role of a bench memo is. I'm one of those people coming from academia that I think a robust debate is always called for uh, when you're talking about important legal issues. So my viewpoint is I let the law clerk draft whatever he or she wants, form their best judgment. I may provide a couple of uh, a couple of uh, uh, suggestions on some avenues that the, the law clerk might want to look at. Uh, but the only thing I'll do at the end of the day is I may put something at the end of the bench memo that says, you know, I disagree with the law clerk's recommendation, um, but nonetheless, you should, you know, advise my colleagues that they should take a close look at the uh, at the suggestion of so my law clerk. So that's really interesting that a memo comes out of your chambers uh, that you don't agree with, but it's circulated among the judges for their thoughts. Right, and and about half of us do it my way, um, and about half of us on the court do it a, do it a different way. They actually uh, uh, try to have the bench memo um, reflect their own views on the case. And after it's circulated, then what happens? Then we all do our reading. For me, um, I read everything submitted in the case, um, at least in terms of the briefs. I read the petitioner's brief. I read, I read the respondent's brief. I read the reply briefs. I read the bench memo. I read the cases or the statutes that may be at play in that particular case. Um, I read any lower court decisions. And then I dictate notes, actually, before the oral argument, some thoughts about the case as I'm reading it. Um, then we have the oral argument. And, and immediately after the oral argument, uh, we have conference later that morning. And, and it's there that the, the chambers that's assigned the bench memo, if, if it's assigned to my chambers, I would give the court a report. I would say, here's how I would come out in the case. And here's how I would write the opinion. And if a majority of the court agrees with me, I'm the presumptive author. I'm the one who gets to go draft the majority opinion. If a majority of the court disagrees with me, then uh, the chief will reassign the case to one of my colleagues. Well, that's interesting. And um, that's where the arguments take place back and forth as to uh, which way the case should be decided. Yes. Now, I know that on the bench, you are a very active questioner. Uh, Notwithstanding the fact that you were one of the juniors on the bench, you really ask, and I've, and I've viewed it, some incisive questions and quite a few questions. Well, one of the things I really, I appreciate you saying that, but one of the things I really try to do is, is prepare. I think it's all about preparing as a judge. And so even though I don't write out my questions in advance, I've thought about a lot of the issues and a lot of the implications of how we might decide the case. If we decided X way, what are the implications 10 years down the road when we get another case? And so a lot of the questions I ask, I ask a lot of hypothetical questions. I ask a lot of questions about um, where, where a particular rule that a party is advocating, where that rule will take us uh, down the line. And so I, I'm hopeful that my, that my questions are helpful to other members of the court, but, but they certainly identify the things that I find uh, most distressful or, or most interesting about a particular case. 
and then really the sides, although most cases are generally unanimous, uh, at least in my perspective as I review the decisions of the court, uh, then there are those where the parties differ, the judges differ, and those are the ones that generally get the most notoriety. That's correct. And, and one thing I haven't been shy about, and, and uh, there's differing views on this, but I have not been shy about if I disagree with members of the court, the majority opinion, I will write a dissent. And I'll write a dissent even if I'm the only member of the court that believes in the particular position that I'm taking. And I think that goes back to what I said earlier, which is, you know, so that the citizens of Minnesota, and so that I know that I'm doing my job and that I'm, I'm not compromising my principles. That's called the Paul Anderson philosophy. Right. You got, you've got to make your, your opinion known. And... Uh, so speaking of Judge Anderson, with whom I know you are very close, you and he certainly differed on the Limmer against Ritchie case, which just came down, the voter ID case, mm -hmm. uh, in which the Secretary of State fashioned uh, how it should be presented on the ballot. And there is a section, I'm trying to, 240D15, subdivision one, of Minnesota statutes, which says that it's the Secretary of State's responsibility to write that heading. The legislature wrote headings. The court came down with the legislature and not with that section uh, of statute. How? And it was a, a really, really rancorous 4-2 decision in which you were with the majority. How do you reach that decision? You know, I, let me say first of all that, that was a tough case. That was a case that 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 was very difficult. Um, both parties made made extremely good arguments. Um, ultimately, not to get too technical here, but where where I ultimately came down was in that particular statute. It talked about the Secretary of State uh, putting together an appropriate title. It uses the word appropriate. And the problem with the statute and, and, the de and, and the word appropriate is it was ambiguous as to what an appropriate title was. And so one of the things that Article 9 of the Minnesota Constitution sets up is it talks about the legislature's role um, in coming up with these amendments. And we have case law that suggests that the form and manner of constitutional amendments is a matter for the legislature. And so ultimately, um, I felt to avoid a constitutional controversy, and I know that other members of the court agreed with me, three other members of the court agreed that when you have an ambiguous term like the word appropriate, one way in which to avoid that constitutional conflict between the Secretary of State and the legislature go with the legislature. is to go with the legislature. And that when the legislature uh, writes a title and passes it through, the, through its process, through the voting process, that that is the appropriate title for the ballot uh, uh, amendment. It was a very difficult decision because there was a lot of, uh, and this isn't necessarily ref reflected in the, in the popular press, but there was a lot, there's constitutional law going on, there's some statutory issues going there. There were a lot of things coming together that made it a lot more difficult than it first appeared to be. Now there's also a statute in Minnesota that says that uh, a law has to stand of itself. And as I understand it, that means that uh, if it requires other laws to become enacted or to become in power, uh, in force, uh, that it's not a good law. And yet we had the voter ID law, uh, or was it the gay marriage law now? No, it's the voter ID in terms of, in the terms voter of, ID, yeah. Voter, uh, yeah, women voters versus Richie, the photo ID law. Uh, where the legislature was pretty fast and loose in just saying there shall be a voter ID. They didn't say how, they didn't say where, they didn't say who had to pay for it, they didn't say uh, what government issued ID is, et cetera, and yet the court with the same four to two majority, you being in the majority, mm -hmm. came down and said, no, the law is good, and that's gonna be a constitutional amendment that uh, we're going to be faced with in this election. I mean, one of the things, that, and you can disagree with how the Constitution lays this out, and it's a, it's a valid disagreement, but as I said with respect to the titles cases, um, the Limmer case, the Constitution uh, sets forth the legislature as, as the branch of government that deals um, with constitutional amendments. And there's, there's a long history, actually, in Minnesota of the legislature writing the, um, the amendment on the ballot in a way that's not the same as the amendment that was passed in the legislature. In other words, a summary 
of, of, what the, of what the legislature passed in terms of the amendment and put to the people. And so one of the things that we had in that, in that case was we, have, we had some case law that suggested, and I'm, I'm not one to overrule case law unless there's a very, very good reason for doing so. Um, we had case law that suggested that was the, that was the job of the legislature, that um, our role was simply to, to make sure that this was not so misleading that it was a palpable evasion of the legislature's duty to submit the amendment to the people. And ultimately, um, even though it was ne not necessarily the most accurate representation, I think we can all agree as to that, it, I did not think it rose to the level of being a pal palpable evasion of their role to put it to the people. So that becomes another tough decision. It was a tough decision, and although I would say that the, the one we just talked about was not as tough a decision necessarily as the first one. And Judge Anderson was really uh, livid in both cases, at least in terms of his writing. And uh, in fact, he's going to be with us in, in a week or so, so we'll get his take on those two cases. No, they were very difficult, but I think that's where, where the collegiality on our court really makes a difference, where despite the fact that, that, that Justice Anderson and I were on, on opposing sides and felt very differently about those cases, um, we still maintain a very friendly relationship. I mean, obviously he was disappointed that the, that the case didn't go the way he thought it should come out, um, but we're still friends after all that all this is over with. And that's really important, though. It's important. And also what's important uh, is to know that Justice Strauss is running for election this year, and you have to turn your ballot over to find the judges. It was just a very good program. Uh, I think Lawrence O'Donnell had it, where the members of West Wing got together to talk about the importance of the non-political issues and to urge people, they were doing it for a judge running for the, uh, I think the Michigan Supreme Court, but it's gonna circulate all over, it's gonna go viral now because they got the whole cast of West Wing together and to urge people to look on the other side of the ballot, much the same as we have to pay attention to the amendments, but here, the judges who are really, really so important in determining what the law is that we follow and the law is that prevails in the state and yet they're not on the front of the ballot with the candidates with the political candidates and you have to look for that it's very important i think it's very important i mean um <coughs> you know we we have been deciding an increasing amount of cases um over the past few years a lot of them are sort of more technical cases but some of them like limmer and and some of the cases you've been talking about have a lot of importance uh, to the citizens of the state. And so I think, you know, if, if citizens are interested in having competent, impartial judges uh, deciding their cases, then it's, I think it's incumbent upon, upon the citizens to turn over that ballot and take a close look and research and think about who they want to be on the court. And under seat four, you will find the name David Strauss. And I wish you the best of luck. And I hope, look forward to seeing you here again in the future. Thank you, Alan. Thank I you. appreciate it. Appreciate it.